afternoon, everyone. I'm Lissy Medvedow, Executive Director of the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy at Boston College Law School, along with my colleagues at the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston at the Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to today's debate, Uber Lyft, Employee versus Independent Contractor, a program of the Greater Boston Debate Series. For housekeeping purposes, this program is being recorded and we are reserving 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. Please use the Q&A function to ask questions and we'll try to get to as many as possible. The Greater Boston Debate Series was launched three years ago to delve into contemporary topics of great importance to residents of Massachusetts and often beyond. Our goal is to have spirited, provocative conversations that illuminate various sides of issues. Respectful discourse is always at the foundation of these discussions, which can, as we say, get messy, but are conducted with the objective of educating us all. Today's debate tackles the question of whether gig workers, specifically Uber and Lyft drivers, should be classified as employees or independent contractors. We, the voters in Massachusetts, may have the opportunity to vote on this issue in November, and as we'll hear shortly, there are various legal and legislative proceedings happening right now with nuances galore. In a perfectly timed article for purposes of today's debate, our moderator, Katie Johnston, has a front page article in the Boston Globe addressing this precise issue and the controversy among the various stakeholders. Katie is a longtime Boston Globe reporter. She writes about labor and income inequality and has been a part of the Globe's business team since 2009. She also covers the gender wage gap, low wage workers, racial and ethnic divisions, and the societal impacts of wealth inequality. She's previously reported on travel, arts, tourism, entertainment, music, comedy, and dining reviews. Her work has received multiple awards from the Labor and Employment Relations Association, the Colorado Press Association, the Oregon Newspaper Association, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Katie is a graduate of the University of Colorado at Boulder. She will now have the pleasure of introducing our two debaters, both of whom are deeply knowledgeable about the issues. Thank you so much, Katie, Shannon, and Connor. Katie, take it away. Thank you so much, all of you. Thanks, Lizzie. Appreciate you asking me to do this. <clears throat> so the big question of the day is, are the drivers for Uber and Lyft, as well as those for DoorDash and Instacart, employees in Massachusetts with benefits and protections guaranteed by state law, as labor advocates, labor advocates insist that they are? Or are they independent contractors who work for themselves and use the app to make extra money? The companies have been treating them this way from the start and are adamant that this is the correct classification. This battle has been going on for several years here and is coming to a head in the next few months. A lawsuit filed in 2020 by Attorney General, then Attorney General Maura Healey, is set to go to trial in a few weeks. The companies have filed legislation and ballot proposals to enshrine them as independent contractors. Unions have filed legislation to formally establish them as employees and sued to try and keep the company's proposals off the ballot in the fall. If this sounds familiar, it's because a judge rejected a similar proposal by the companies in 2022, and it never went before voters. There's also a bill and potential ballot measure that would give the drivers the right to unionize. So suffice to say, there's a lot going on. And I'm here with two people who can tell you a lot more about the issue. Labor lawyer Shannon Liss Reardon and tech company representative Connor Units. Shanelis Reardon has represented working people as a labor lawyer for more than 20 years. She's brought groundbreaking lawsuits that have shaped the law protecting workers in food service, cleaning, adult entertainment, trucking, and other industries. She's currently representing workers in a number of cases against gig economy companies that she says save on labor costs by misclassifying employees as independent contractors. Shannon is a graduate of Harvard Law School and Harvard College and co-founded the firm Lichten and Liss Reardon in 2009. Connor Units is the Executive Vice President at Issues Management Group. Since January of 2021, he has worked with app-based ride-hailing companies and drivers, Massachusetts Coalition for Independent Work, 
and the Flexibility and Benefits for Massachusetts Drivers Ballot Committee. He has previously served as spokesperson for the campaigns of Congressman Stephen Lynch, Middlesex District Attorney Marion Ryan, and ballot question legislative and mayoral campaigns throughout Massachusetts. Connor attended the George Washington University and the McCormick School of Public Policies at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Their bios are also available um, in the chat and on the Rappaport website. So Shannon and Connor, each of you can take a few minutes to introduce your side. Shannon, I think you won the coin toss to go first, right? I, I think I did. Thank you, Katie. I'm very happy to be here today. Excited to be able to talk about this really important topic. And this is a topic that has been central to my life for many years. Um, as you just explained, I am a labor lawyer. And for the last 10 years, I have been representing gig workers in Massachusetts and around the country, fighting for their rights as employees. Uh, and this issue is now really coming to a head in Massachusetts in the coming weeks and months. What Stepping back, the big picture here is that what these companies have done, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, Grubhub, you, you name it, Instacart, you've heard of all of them. They have, starting with Uber just over 10 years ago, set up this whole system whereby they claim that their workers, the people who make their companies what they are, are not actually employees. And by doing that, by calling them independent contractors, they keep these workers from getting all of the hard fought benefits that have been battled for for decades in Massachusetts and around the country. They stop the workers from getting things like basic minimum wage, overtime, unemployment, workers comp, protection against discrimination, paid family medical leave, and so many other protections that we have here in Massachusetts. Reports have come out again and again that have shown that these gig workers, when you take into account how much they have to pay for their vehicles, they are making less than minimum wage. They are relying heavily on state services, and that ends up coming out of taxpayer money because we all have to support these workers to make up for the payments that these companies are not making. Um, Uber and Lyft last year alone, along with these other gig companies, brought in more than a billion dollars in revenue in Massachusetts, and yet they are not paying anything into our social service programs, not into our unemployment system, our workers' comp program. They're not paying employer share of payroll taxes. So depriving these workers of employee benefits is not only hurting the workers, it's hurting the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and it's hurting you and me. It's hurting taxpayers because these social services funds are not being funded. Now, what these companies are going to tell you, and I'm sure what Connor is about to tell you when he gets his chance to speak, is that, oh, all of these rules and these laws that we've had for decades, these are just old fashioned. And you know what? The workers don't want these protections. The workers want to be independent contractors. Well, when they say that, what they're really saying is that the workers want to have flexibility and ability to work when they want and where they want. And yes, that is why these apps are so popular with workers. But you know what? As a labor lawyer for more than 25 years, I can tell you that that argument is based on a lie. There is no reason why workers can't have flexibility, ability to work when and where they want, and have the protections that we have in place for workers. Um, this is such a crucial issue. If we don't succeed, I'm working with a coalition of organizations that are trying to keep this ballot measure off the ballot this November, which we succeeded in in 2022. If this doesn't succeed and this goes to the ballot, Uber and Lyft and all these companies are going to try to do here in Massachusetts just what they did in California four years ago in 2020, when they paid more than $200 million to pass a ballot initiative called Prop 22. What that ballot initiative did was it rewrote the law for the companies and declared the workers to be independent contractors. Now, exit polls in California showed that voters were confused. They had been so bombarded with misleading advertising by the companies that they came out of the voting booth thinking that they had voted to support the workers, not realizing that they had voted to support the position that the companies were trying to get them to take. This may come before the voters in Massachusetts in November, and if it does, I really hope that the word gets out and the Massachusetts voters understand that they're being sold 
a, a package of goods, just like the workers are, that somehow the only way workers can keep flexibility and autonomy is to be deprived of all labor protections. It's just not true. In Massachusetts, the eyes of the country are going to be on us this year and in November in particular, because this is ground zero for this fight. If these companies get away with this in Massachusetts, they're going to try to take it national. They're going to try to upend employee rights, not just here in Massachusetts, but across the country. And we could be talking not just about the rights of gig workers. This is slippery slope. If these companies get away with taking away workers' rights, it's just going to be one after another of industries that try to chip away at all these hard fought rights that advocates have fought for years. And just one last thing before I finish my closing statement. The reason this is happening now is very specific. We've had legal battles going on about this for years. I've personally been involved in these legal battles in Massachusetts and around the country for more than 10 years. Finally, uh, the, the door is closing on these companies because the attorney general's office has been pursuing a lawsuit against them for years now, and it is finally going to trial. The companies realize that their back is up against a wall, and they are likely to be declared to be in violation of Massachusetts law very soon. And that is why they are now trying to roll out this ballot initiative in order to try to defend themselves against this lawsuit. It's the exact same thing they did in California in 2020, and we can't let them do it here in Massachusetts again. Thank you. Connor. Thank you, Katie. And I want to thank Lissy and the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy, as well as Catherine and Polly and the Rappaport Institute for Greater Boston for bringing us here today to talk about this critical issue. And I'd like to level set for a minute and talk about why we were actually here. And I think you just heard a great example. We are at this point proposing a ballot question to protect drivers' independence because for more than four years now, government officials, labor unions, and trial attorneys have been talking down to app-based rideshare and delivery drivers. They have been insisting to drivers that they, these special interests, know what's better for drivers. They have been insisting to drivers that they, drivers, will be better off as employees, as if most drivers are not already or have not previously been employees of other companies and in other industries. They are insisting to drivers that employment is a magic cure-all to any problems or concerns that they have. They tell drivers to trust them because they know better. They say that drivers in California didn't understand. They say that drivers in Massachusetts just don't understand. That's why we're here today, because nearly four years ago, the attorney general brought a lawsuit that would completely upend the lives of drivers, force them to be employees, and change everything about ride share and delivery driving that prompted them to pick up their keys in the first place. Much of what you just heard from my opponent and much of what you will hear from the opposition both today and through this campaign are half-truths and empty promises. So let's level set with the facts. First, by the end of 2024, the status quo for the app-based rideshare and delivery industry will almost certainly be fundamentally changed one way or another. Either drivers will be forced by the attorney general to become employees or drivers will prevail and maintain their independence while securing historic new benefits and protections as independent contractors. Second, the ballot question that our coalition has proposed would guarantee drivers an income above minimum wage while ensuring they keep their tips. It will provide them with health care stipends, paid sick time, occupational accident insurance, protections against discrimination, and a clear pathway to appeal deactivations. That is not the status quo. That is independence plus benefits, a combination supported by 85% of Massachusetts drivers in our most recent survey, and that number has gone up every year that we have asked. Third, our ballot question will secure all of these things for drivers while allowing them to maintain the minute by minute flexibility they cherish and demand. And make no mistake, no matter what claims you will hear to the contrary, there are no employment scenarios, no other industries where this type of minute by minute flexibility exists. We're not talking about the flexibility to work remote or have a hybrid schedule. We're talking about the flexibility to decide at any given moment of any given day, whether or not you wanna turn on an app and make money using any number of different platforms. We're talking about the flexibility to decide you only want to make one delivery today and turn the app off after 15 minutes, or the flexibility to drive for nine hours one day and not again for the rest of the month, or to take vacations without approval from your boss, to take a sick day without having to explain yourself to human resources. We're talking about the flexibility to open apps from three or four different companies at the same time and decide at that moment which opportunity offers you the best earnings potential. 
More importantly, we are talking about these things because we are listening to drivers. We ask them about their experience. We ask them how they use these apps, how policy changes could make their lives better instead of telling them what's best for them and forcing them to be something they fundamentally say they do not want to be. And you will hear our opponents claim to speak for drivers, and they certainly speak for some, a very vocal minority. And we know that because we have asked drivers every year if they want to be employees or independent contractors. And every year we hear the same thing. Roughly 75% of them want to remain independent. Now, our opponents will tell you that our polls conducted by the same pollsters that Governor Maura Healy uses are somehow skewed in our favor. So I will defer to our opponents. In March of 2023, organized labor held a rally outside the state house. And one of their most prominent drivers, a gentleman who has testified at every hearing over the last four years and speaks at every rally opposing our effort, said, and I quote, that maybe only a quarter of the drivers he knows want to become employees, end quote. That is one of our most prominent opponents, quoted in the Boston Business Journal, confirming the data that we have been reporting all along. Our effort to protect the independence of drivers is predicated on the stated preferences and desires of the drivers themselves. And throughout this conversation and throughout this effort, we will continue to elevate those voices because the voices of drivers are the ones that truly matter in this debate. Thank you, and I look forward to an engaging discussion today. Thanks, Connor and Shannon. <clears throat> so I think we pretty much agree on everything, right? Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Um Shannon, I wonder if you could, you mentioned this in your um, opening statement, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about why this is such a big deal. I know some in the labor, labor movement say that how these gig drivers are classified could affect the future of work, right? Can you talk about you know, th th there's this potential for app-based jobs to grow, right? And so this is not just about drivers. This is about um, much more than that. This is absolutely not just about drivers. This is the tip of the iceberg. And and what Uber and Lyft and these other companies have done is absolutely nothing new. This, this is the kind of battle that I've been fighting throughout my legal career. So many companies have tried to get away with a scam of claiming that workers are in business for themselves when they're really not. They're really obviously working for and supporting a great, much greater, bigger business doing their work. Um, we've seen it in the cleaning industry and the adult entertainment industry and the trucking industry. The list goes on and on. But Uber and Lyft and these other app-based companies took this deception to a whole new level by trying to claim that they're doing something new because the work is distributed to the workers through an app. And we are unfortunately seeing this spiral into so many other industries too, into education, into healthcare, into you name it. You see the Uber for this, the Uber for that. And the reason why this is such an existential threat to not only the labor movement, but, but really employment as we know it in this country is because if this battle by these gig companies succeeds, they could undermine employment protections throughout our entire economy, because that could just fuel the growth of even more industries relying on the so-called app-based work in order to justify not providing employment benefits to the workers and calling them independent contractors. And, and I just wanna note also, um, the audit, our state auditor just last week released a report showing that these companies have cost the state hundreds of millions of dollars in revenues that should have gone into the state's coffers to help support our social support programs. So again, this isn't a question uh, that, again, Uber and Lyft and these companies want to say, oh, this is what the drivers want. This is what the drivers want. But I would ask viewers to ask yourselves, if this is what the drivers want, why are these companies spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to get these ballot initiatives passed? In California, they spent more than $200 million to get the similar Prop 22 passed. We understand that they are prepared to spend tens of millions, if not more than $100 million in Massachusetts to get the same result. If they cared so much about what the drivers wanted, nothing in our laws is stopping them from just giving them to the drivers. Nothing right now is stopping them from paying the drivers more, reimbursing them for expenses, allowing them to take um, time off, uh, paid family leave. There, It absolutely makes no sense if you just ask yourself, why would the companies go to such efforts and spend so much money 
fight this lawsuit by drivers and by the attorney general's office, and now fund this ballot initiative in order to just provide benefits to the drivers when they could do it right now. It's because they want something in return. They want to be not responsible for all the things that employers, every other employer in Massachusetts and around the country is responsible for. They want to buy themselves a law so that they don't have to contribute what they owe as employers to the workers uh, and to the state and to all of us as taxpayers. Well, yes, you just queued up my next question for Connor. Um, Can I address something? I there, there were like four different answers in there. I'd just like to address some of those things. First off, our sure. ballot question and our legislation only apply to app-based ride-share and delivery drivers. It's pretty hard to get more specific than that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the state auditor, I should note, did not release the report publicly last week. It was actually publicly released today, although I know it was shared with our uh, opponents last week. Um, and it was based on data from a study funded by labor that the report admits was partisan. And the, the labor groups involved are groups that not only endorsed the auditor, but have financially contributed to her. And even then, the report notes that as drivers currently are classified as independent contractors, they do not make claims on the UI system or any of the other public systems. So they're not costing the state any money. And it notes that as independent contractors, no additional payments from the companies are required. Third, I want to address this uh, notion that the companies uh, can provide benefits right now to independent contractors. No company can provide these benefits to independent contractors under existing law without the risk of getting sued by trial lawyers. So there, there's a very real reason why a law change is needed to provide these benefits to independent contractors. Okay, great. And so also, Connor, I'm wondering if you can address um, Shannon's question about, so why are the companies spending hundreds of millions of dollars around the country pushing for these laws to establish that drivers are independent contractors? I mean, you say it's what the drivers want, but it's also much less expensive for the tech companies not to be considered employers, correct? That question I can't speak to. I would note that it, it never seems to bother labor groups when they spend tens of millions of dollars to proactively change the law, as the nurses tried to do in 2018, as the teachers did last year, as the teachers are gearing up to do this year. Uh, it's only a problem when, when organizations spend uh, millions of dollars to change laws they don't agree with. Um, aside from that, this is the nature of the industry. This is what allows drivers to operate as they want to with the flexibility that allows consumers to benefit, that allows small businesses to benefit, allows drivers to benefit. I, I just want to point out that the more than $200 million that the gig industry spent on passing Prop 22 in California was the most expensive ballot initiative in this nation's history. And the amount that they are poised to spend here in Massachusetts is likely going to be the most expensive ballot initiative in Massachusetts. And again, I ask everyone to ask yourselves, who, who is this for the benefit for? If this is really for the benefit of the workers, why are the gig companies putting so much money behind it? That's pure speculation. Okay. Um, so Shannon, um, Massachusetts is known for its strong labor laws. Can you walk us through how the independent contractor ABC test plays into this fight and why it's significant that this is happening here and, and how this compares to Prop 22 in California? Yes, Massachusetts has long been known as one of the most, if not the most, protective state in the country, recognizing employee rights. Uh, and what is so unfortunate is if the gig companies get their way here, they could turn us to the other end of the spectrum and make us the least, if not one of the most least, protective states in the country for workers' rights. And, and also, just to go back to what Connor said, a moment ago, even though this particular initiative or this group of initiatives that are being proposed specifically refers to app-based drivers, this is a slippery slope. It's the tip of the iceberg. If they win, then like I said before, every industry is going to get in line in order to be next. So let me, I'll tell you briefly, uh, I, could, I could teach a course on Massachusetts law, but in particular, our independent contractor law has well been recognized as being so protective and it's being copied by other states. It's called an ABC test, which requires that in order for an employer to justify classifying a worker as an independent contractor, the employer has the burden to show three parts of a test. They're called A, B, and C. Um, and they have to show all three parts of the test or else the worker is deemed to be an employee. The first factor has to do with how much control the employer, the alleged employer has over the alleged employee. The 
second factor has to do with whether or not the work is performed in the company's usual course of business. And the third factor concerns whether or not the worker is involved in their own independently established trade or business or occupation. The second factor is what makes the Massachusetts law so strict, because it means that if a worker is performing businesses that are within the usual course of a company's business, then that worker is that company's employees. So in the case of Uber and Lyft, it is beyond clear that these are transportation companies and the workers provide transportation services. Therefore, they are employees. It means if you're an accountant and you work for an accounting firm, you're the accounting firm's employee. It means that if you are, um, if you sell bagels at a bakery, you, you're working within the usual course of that company's business and you're their employee. Now, however, if you're a plumber who goes in and visits business offices or residential houses on your own, on your own schedule, and you fix the pipes, you may be an independent contractor because the company or the alleged employer in that case would be able to satisfy all three prongs of A, B, and C. Now, the companies really hate this ABC test, so that's why they've been battling it so hard. But other states have been looking to our test in order to strengthen worker protections. That's what California did, which led to the backlash in 2020 of these companies getting Prop 22 passed. The California Supreme Court actually looked into around the country to try to find the best test to distinguish between employees and independent contractors and picked the Massachusetts ABC test because of the strength of the test and how much worker protection it gave. Um, and we've seen other efforts in other parts of the country. New Jersey um, did something similar and other states like Illinois, Connecticut, there are a number of states that use a similar test to the Massachusetts test. But if these companies succeed in declaring app-based drivers to be independent contractors, we, along with California now, will be the least protective state. I will note that in California, there is an initiative before, there's a petition before the California Supreme Court to strike Prop 22 down as unconstitutional. It may well still be declared to be illegal, like we are trying to get these initiatives declared here in Massachusetts in a case that will be argued next week at the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. So Connor, as you pointed out, you know, many of these drivers are part-time and they're probably fine being independent contractors, but there are a good number that do drive full-time um, and rely on this to make a living. And, um, you know, as you pointed out, a quarter of the drivers that this driver referenced, you know, want to be employees. Um, and Uber and Lyft couldn't, couldn't function without these people doing their jobs, right? So shouldn't they be entitled to, especially the full-time people, entitled to a safety net that comes with most jobs? Uh, Katie, I should note that there are hundreds, or excuse me, thousands, 200,000 job openings in Massachusetts, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And for drivers who want a traditional job, one that has a schedule and shifts and a manager, there are literally thousands of those jobs available. And I'll get you even more specific a focus on driving jobs. The Mass Taxpayers Foundation put out a new report at the beginning of this month on MBTA staffing, including for bus operators. And that report found that while the T is making progress, it still has more than 150 open positions as of February of this year, despite offering signing bonuses of $7,500, a wage for starting bus drivers that it's already going up from $22 to $30 an hour, plus state employee benefits. That also found that 550 employees had left the T for non-retirement reasons in the last year. So these MBTA jobs are, are driving jobs. They offer everything our opponents say the drivers want, and the T cannot fill its open positions, and it cannot keep a huge percentage of the people they do hire. So with all these hundreds of thousands of jobs available in Massachusetts and all these driving jobs with great pay and benefit benefits available, why do so many people still prefer to drive as independent contractors? Perhaps it's because what drivers are telling us is the truth. They prefer to be independent, that they make good wages, an average of $26 an hour on the, per the study that we commissioned that looked at actual expenses. And the vast majority of them do not want to be employees. These jobs are out there. I, I, I can just expand an example. Radio Boston did a, uh, on WBUR did a segment a couple of weeks ago uh, on this topic, and they had a driver from each side. And the driver uh, that was on to oppose our position 
gave this example of driving and, and all the things she didn't like about it. And, and the host, Titiana Daring, asked her, well, if driving is so terrible, why do you still do it? And she was the driver responded, I don't. I'm an actual independent contractor. I do it as needed. And I thought that was really telling. This is an individual who spends her free time talking about how terrible all the companies are and how much she hates driving. She can still turn the app on any time she wants to to earn extra money, in her own words, as needed. That's independence, and that is a freedom that is generally not shared by employees. So you mentioned- I just, I just want to respond, if I can, just respond to that last thing, because it's an argument that we hear over and over again that somehow if you're an employee, you can't have that freedom to work when you want and where you want. And as a labor lawyer for more than 25 years, I can say that's just not true. There are plenty of kinds of jobs where you can work where you want, when you want. People, especially since the pandemic, we have all seen how flexible working environments are for many people. Lots of people work from home and they do piece work, meaning that they work as much as they want or as little as they want and they work wherever they want, but they're still employees. So again, the reason that these polls that Connor mentions claim that workers want to be independent contractors, what they're saying, it all depends on what question you ask them. What they're saying is that they want to be able to choose their work hours. They want to be able to work as much or as little as they want. We understand that is why people are drawn to these apps, but that, that doesn't mean that they're not entitled to the employment protections that are so important and have been put in place by our courts and our legislature over the decades to protect workers from companies who would take advantage of them, just like these companies are doing. And so they can have that flexibility. They can work when they want. They can work where they want. And they can get these benefits that all employees receive. And if companies are allowed to get away with not paying those benefits, again, they're not only shortchanging the workers, uh, the state, and all of us as taxpayers, but they're also shortchanging complying competitors, other companies that are trying to do the right thing by their workers and give them the protections that they want, along with the freedom and flexibility they want. If these companies can get away with not having to pay the obligations all employers have, they're going to undercut competitors who are actually trying to play by the rules and pay those things, um, making it a race to the bottom and making it really, really hard for any companies to actually survive in this financial environment and provide the protections that they should be provided. That's why we have laws. That's why we have rules to make sure that everyone is on a level playing field and that everyone is bound by the same rules. And, and there's there's a good reason that those rules have been put in place. And there's a reason why workers advocates have been fighting for years and years and years to make sure they're enforced. These companies have just gotten away for more than a decade without following those rules. And the hammer is finally coming down on them. Um, and that's why they're trying to buy themselves a new law so that they don't have to comply with these laws. Shannon, I wonder if you can just give some examples of the industries where these people are working, you're saying with this ultimate flexibility like that they have with these apps? Well, like I said, the most common scenario is people who work from home. There are plenty of situations where people are doing peace, peace work at their yeah, but what But what kind of work are you talking about? Were there yeah, employees in doing this? Were there employees? Yes. You know, manufacturing type jobs where you're putting things together in your house. Um, I represent, I've spent much of my career representing hospitality workers, servers, wait staff, bartenders. It is very commonplace for them to work in a so-called on-call setting where they can go in and work shifts when they want to, pick them up when they want to, work part-time, work occasionally, work once a month, work once every two months, work full-time for several months. They're still paid as employees. They still get employment and workers' comp and the employer share of payroll taxes are paid by the employer and the employer pays into unemployment and workers' comp and, and all of that. So there's, no, there's nothing new about these industries. Uh, I've also represented cleaning workers over the years who have been caught up in a similar scam where cleaning international cleaning companies claim that they're independent contractors and so they don't pay into any of these things. Um, and... The companies have been held again and again in court to be employees and they can work, you know, they can pick up the cleaning jobs that they want. Um, it's there. There's nothing fundamental about work that in order to have flexibility and how much you work, you have to be declared an independent contractor. It is just a lie that these companies are pushing in order to 
had their bottom lines and not have to pay their obligations to their workers and to the state. Hey, Katie, I think that that is kind of what we hear when we push on this. We hear apples to orange comparisons that are nothing to do with the actual flexibility we're talking about. And as I laid out in my opening, we're talking about minute by minute flexibility. We're not talking about somebody who's on call and gets called in for a shift. We're talking about people that's up to them to decide minute by minute which company they want to do a, a job for, uh, how long they want to do that job, where they want to go with it. I, I, you know, I use the example when I was younger and I worked at the Westgate Mall in Brockton. I worked at Macy's and I worked at a uh, movie theater across the street. I was part time at both, but I didn't work for both companies during the same shift. It's not like I folded a sweater and then ran across the street and started the, the projector and clocked out there and ran back. And that's the kind of flexibility that we're talking about. You can imagine a driver and anyone that's been in, a, in an app, a, a Lyft or an Uber knows that a driver is gonna get pinged from different apps and they're gonna look for the opportunity that's closest to them or it's most convenient for them or offers them the most earnings potential. And they're able to go app to app to pick the best one or pick no jobs at all. When we asked drivers last month in our in our most recent survey, what were some of the things that were most important to them? 97% said the ability to choose when and where they could work. And 96% said the ability to decline a delivery or a ride. That is not something that employees generally are allowed to do. You can't, you know, if you're in the hospitality industry and, and your manager says, go clean that room, you can't say, nah, I'm good. I'm going to go home for the day, right? That's you're going to get terminated or suspended. There are repercussions to that as an employee. There are no repercussions to declining a ride as a, as a driver because of this independence and flexibility. And that, I think, is one of the fundamental differences that are woefully mis mischaracterized by our opposition. If I could just respond to that quickly. So once again, what these companies are saying is that because technology has made something possible that it wasn't really possible in the past. The idea that you could be working for one employer and then flip on and off the switch and go work for another employer fundamentally changes the nature of work. And it doesn't. It's just the fact that we do now have these apps on our phones that allow us to turn something on and turn something off. So just because there's the ability to go back and forth like that doesn't mean that when someone is working for a particular company, servicing that company's clients, that person should be getting paid as an employee and get all the rights and benefits that employees get. Now, something that's just that's really important is that these companies, they say they say that they want to be independent contractors. They say that the employees, you know, you know, that the workers want to have all these benefits, which um, they can have the benefits of being able to work flexibly and still and still get all the benefits. But the um, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought on that point. Um, the, the, here's what I was going to say. The, it may be because there are so many people out there who are doing this work on a very occasional basis that when Connor points to survey results that say that 75% want to be independent contractors, you know, A, it's because they're being misled and deceived by the companies that this is the only way that they can keep that flexibility. But, but B, another really important thing to think about is that there are a lot of workers out there who are making their living off of these apps full time. So, you know, it could very well be that that 25% that was referred to are the people who are working these jobs full time and they want the benefits that you get as an employee. The people who say, oh, I want to be able to turn it on and off and just do it an hour or two every week or two or every month or so, they are doing a very, very small portion of the actual work. If you, if you look at the chart, all, the charts always go like a very steep, a very steep um, curve where you've got a thin slice of the worker population is doing the vast majority of the work. And most of them are working full time or way more than full time, of course, without being paid overtime. And a very and a large portion of workers are working very, very, very occasionally. But that only takes into account actually a small portion of the work being done. So I know it's a little complicated statistically to think about it, but Putting summing it up, most of the work is actually being performed by these app-based workers who are working full time in these jobs. They're using these jobs to try to support themselves, their families, pay their rent, put food on the table, and they need and they deserve these protections.
And isn't it possible, and I don't know the answer to this, couldn't these companies do it both ways? Couldn't they, the full-time people, couldn't they make them employees and the people who just, who want the ultimate flexibility, could they be independent contractors? Is that a model that exists? Well, I mean, the point is, is that you have part-time workers throughout the economy and you don't check your rights at the door because you're working part-time as opposed to full-time. We don't have a two-tiered employment system whereby part-time workers don't have the rights of employees. So it also just raises the question, why why wouldn't the companies just give the workers these benefits? And if it's in the company's interest to provide this platform that allows workers all these all this flexibility, which the workers want, they say, why not just give it to them and give them the support of and the benefits that they're owed as employees, nothing is stopping them from doing this. Nothing in the law is stopping them from doing this. Connor said earlier, oh, well, if we give them any benefits, it'll bring trial lawyers out to accuse us of being the employer. But you know what? We've been having that battle for 10 years now. Those cases have been ongoing. There's nothing about giving them those benefits that's putting them at any more legal risk. The reason they're at legal risk is because they've been breaking the law in Massachusetts for more than a decade. I, I want to come back to this, this idea of these drivers in your example that are doing this full time and come back to the question of why, because as I outlined, the jobs are there, right? The jobs are there. So why would drivers choose this work over this employment? And I think what we fail to take into account is that our general employment system is extremely flawed, right? This is a low barrier to entry position. If you have a driver's license, a clean driving history, pass a state mandated background check, you can be an app based rideshare delivery driver. There was no employment interview, no resume, no network you need to leverage, no degree requirement, not even a language requirement. Virtually any adult of any background can turn on an app and earn money for themselves and their families. And the same cannot be said for the vast majority of employment opportunities in this Commonwealth. And, and that's before you even take into account the history of systemic racism in our employment system. So these are you know, folks that are coming to an opportunity to earn money with low barrier to entry and what these proposals would do is completely upend that and transform it into the rest of the economy that puts folks at a different at disadvantage. So uh, that, argument, of... that argument just makes no sense. There's, there's nothing that says that just because these workers would have employment benefits, it would make it harder for people to get these jobs. If Uber and Lyft and Instacart and DoorDash want to continue their services, having these workers provide these services, they can keep hiring them to do it and pay them the way wages that they owe them as employees. And any applicant, like any other employment job, would have to do an interview process, would have to do, uh, would potentially, there could be any tests for any other employment job. There could be degree requirements. There could be language requirements. There are different things that go into that that would make it a harder, a harder industry to enter for the folks that depend on it for any type of earning they're looking for now. And, and there the are companies a lot of wouldn't that. Companies wouldn't need to do that. All right. Well, so again, are... so again, though, pra laws have practical realities. And I like this, hype, you know, where we talk a lot about, oh, well, the law doesn't prevent this, the law doesn't prevent that. The law doesn't prevent a lot of things, but there are realities to employment that are, that are, there are, again, there are reasons that people are choosing this work when all these other jobs are available. It's because of the low barrier to entry. It's because of the flexibility. There are things they love about this work that simply are not available to them in an employment setting. All right, well, and the company say, what, provides and, that low barrier to entry and those employment benefits and allow them to work whenever they want. All right. Okay. Moving on. But but related, um, a, a lot of the drivers uh, for these companies are immigrants, um, which is to, to both your points. Um, two years ago, um, I talked to a woman, Prasi Namanda. She's an Instacart driver from Uganda, and she's actually on the front page of the industry website. Uh, pushing for independent contractor status. And I talked to her as someone who supports being an independent contractor. But Prasi told me she thinks that the companies are taking advantage of the workers, particularly immigrants, who may not fully understand the issue or be willing to push back against an industry that's providing some of the best jobs available for those with limited English, to your point, Connor. She said the companies know the kind of people they have, so they know how to exploit them. But at the same time, she didn't want to risk losing her flexibility, which is what the companies say will happen if they become employees. So she decided to join the less risky fight to stay independent, still realizing or, or thinking all of these things about the company and her fellow immigrants being taken advantage of. I just found that her 
understanding of this to be so profound. And I just wondered if either one of you wanted to, to weigh in on that. Uh, having represented immigrant workers throughout my career, I, I understand her plight and what she's talking about. Unfortunately, employers are taking advantage of immigrant workers even more so than other types of workers because they know they can get away with it. And I do agree that the so-called app-based workforce is very heavily dominated by a lot of these immigrant workers who are being taken advantage of. And once again, these companies are selling them a bill of goods saying, you can have, and I've seen this in so many different industries, cleaning industry and the trucking industry, you can have your own business. You can have the American dream. You are your own boss. You know what? They're not their own boss. They are beholden to these apps. When the apps ping them and tell them there's a job on the way, uh, they better accept it within seconds or else it goes away. They are living day to day and hour to hour to make ends meet. They are not getting minimum wage. They're not getting overtime. They're not getting any of these other benefits, but they're told, oh, but you get to work whenever you want. But again, they could work whenever they want and get all those benefits. What these companies are doing is they are shifting the expenses of employment onto their workers. So if you think about Uber and Lyft, they're car services, but they've come up with this brilliant idea where as a car service, they don't have to pay for a single car. They make their low wage workers come to work every day with a several thousand dollar piece of equipment, which is a car. These delivery companies, DoorDash and Instacart and others, they're doing the same thing. They're, they are food delivery companies without having to pay for any delivery vehicles. They're pushing those expenses onto their workers and they're selling it to their workers as though this is your own business, but it's not true. But these workers, and I talk to them every day, are beholden to these companies and their lives are completely controlled in to the min most minute detail by these companies. Yes, they can sign on when they want, but when they're working, they're beholden to them. They better make those deliveries quickly. They better get to those customers quickly or they get penalized and then they may not get good jobs. And so they live in fear that they're going to be penalized. They're not going to do something right. They're going to get kicked off the app, which happens all the time. Uh, and, and they're powerless. So that was a lot about the status quo. And I'm not here talking about the status quo or defending the status quo. I'm talking about a ballot question that would set an earnings floor of 120% of minimum wage for drivers that would allow them to keep their tips, guarantee them at least 28 cents per mile to cover vehicle maintenance costs, uh, allow them to earn paid sick time, just like employees do, including part-time employees to, to, um, to earn a healthcare stipend, to have a clear pathway to appeal deactivations. And, it, uh, and I, I should note that drivers today have the option to never drive again, never turn an app back on for months or years between rides or deliveries, and that will continue. That type of flexibility is not accounted for in a lot of these other uh, employment scenarios. And, and again, we're not here to talk about the status quo, we're talking about the ballot question and the path forward. The, the wage promises that Connor just said are, are actually not correct. So the claim is, is that this initiative would provide 120% of minimum wage to the drivers, but the way they count it, they're only counting the actual so-called time when they are actually on a delivery or making doing a ride. They're not counting the downtime while they're waiting for the next ride or the next delivery. So it doesn't really come to 120% of minimum wage as study after study has shown, it comes to well less than the minimum wage, especially taking into account the expenses that the employees have to pay. And the initiative provides for 26 cents per mile for reimbursement. Well, you know what? The IRS reimbursement rate is more like 56 cents per mile. So it doesn't come from anywhere to what, the I, what the IRS has determined to be the actual cost of maintaining a vehicle here. And again, if they wanted to pay 120% of minimum wage and reimburse for expenses, no one is stopping them from doing that. We don't need to have them pass their $100 million law in order to avoid all of their other obligations as employers. So again, it's it's that 28 cents a mile reimbursement. They can still deduct the 56 cents a mile the IRS allows from their taxes because they're independent contractors. 120% of minimum wage is based on engaged time, which is the time from the moment a driver accepts a ride to the time or, or delivery to the time that ride or delivery is completed. That engaged time is what allows this flexibility to function. 
it, under under another scenario, a, a driver in your scenario, Shannon, will be paid from the time they turn the app on. Well, what if they have three different apps going at the same time? That you know, you could have three different companies paying a driver that isn't actually making any deliveries or or doing any rides. That kind of scenario wouldn't make sense in any industry. Again, there are realities, economic realities, to any of these proposed laws that are that are completely ignored by our opposition. And the economic reality is that there is going to be downtime between jobs. I mean, think about a at a barista at a cafe who waits on customers, serves coffee, and you know waits a few minutes every now and then between customers. So you're just going to turn off her payroll so she's not paid between customers. Imagine a receptionist sitting in an office who's answering the phone and greeting people at the door. Are you just not going to pay her between phone calls and someone coming to the door? Uh, I mean, the, the way these companies have operated is they've got this brilliant system where they have this massive workforce ready to provide services at the drop of a hat or the press of a button by a customer, but without having to pay those people to be sitting around waiting. And that's exactly what they're trying to do here is that they are trying to put forth this, this system where they only have to pay for so-called engaged time so that the workers are sitting around not being paid at all between jobs while they're waiting. And then meanwhile, the companies flood the market with the workers so that they have someone ready to pick up their customer anywhere they are, anytime they press that button and the workers have to sit around unpaid waiting for the next job. So that totally benefits the companies. In both of those scenarios you outlined, the employer, whether it's a waitress or a, a, an assistant, the company knows where that person is and is accountable for their time. The, the app companies have no way, to, the app platforms have no way to know that. They don't know if a driver is currently engaged in a rider delivery with another platform, which it's completely up to the driver to do. That would not fly in either of the scenarios you mentioned. If, 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 a, if a restaurant is paying a waitress waiting for the next table, they're not gonna continue paying that waitress if she disappears to go to the restaurant next door to do a table there. Again, it's apples to oranges comparisons that just don't have a relevant uh, uh, example for the actual flexibility we're talking about in any industry that exists. So we have a, a question um, from the audience, um, which I don't think we can answer. They want to know the, the wording of the ballot initiative in November, which I'm sure we don't have yet. But Connor, I wonder, could, could you summarize what it, you wa they want it to be? Yeah, I, I think this is a, is a great thing to clarify at this point. And as Shannon alluded to, there will be a, a hearing next week. Um, we have currently filed five different versions of our question. Uh, and the reason we filed five is because uh, our opponents were very clear that they were going to sue to, to keep anything off the ballot like they did in 2022. Um, and so we took the attorney, excuse me, the Supreme Judicial Court's feedback into account as we crafted these versions. Um, and as expected, they were all sued by our opponents and, and it's set to go next week to a hearing. We have been very clear. We're only going to put one question on the ballot. Um, which version will be determined once we get through um, once we get through the SJC hearing? But it will be one question. There's no attempt to confuse voters, as we've been accused of. Uh, if anything, it's it's our opposition who continually is trying to keep this from reaching voters. Do you know how it might be worded? I know you don't know the exact wording, but you're basically saying make drivers independent contractors with some new benefits. Our goal has always been to achieve a solution that ensures that drivers can remain independent independent contractors while uh, accessing these new benefits, yes. And and what they've done, it actually is just a continuation of the litigation tactics that I've seen them bring in court for more than 10 years. Um, coming up with five different versions of this initiative to try to say to the SJC, look, one of them must be okay, is, is really just confusing. And it's what we've seen them do over and over again in court. But basically what, what they are saying here is all of the different versions are in one way or another saying that the drivers are independent contractors. And you know the reason why the SJC threw it out last time was because they recognize that this goes way beyond not only how workers are classified for employment law purposes, but what the companies are actually also trying to do is prevent them themselves from being sued for personal injury when there are accidents with drivers, which happens, of course, unfortunately, all the time. So you've got uh, passengers and bystanders who have been injured 
in accidents with drivers, delivery drivers and Uber and Lyft drivers. And then the companies, if, if the drivers are the employees of the companies, then the companies will be responsible for paying for the injuries to these bystanders and passengers. But if the drivers are independent contractors, then the companies can say, oh, no, 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 we're not responsible. That's the driver because he's his own company. The SJC said, wait a minute, you can't do all of that in one ballot initiative. You're telling people this has to do with employment rights, but really what you're doing is trying to protect yourselves from tort liability when there are accidents. You, you can't do that. And, and really what they're doing is just trying to get away with the same thing all over again. And that'll be talked about at the hearing next week before the SJC. So we're hoping that this won't go before the voters because it's a complicated policy choice, which the Constitution says if you're going to give voters a choice on a ballot initiative, they have to have something that they can either say yes or no to. You can't try to weave in complicated multiple policy decisions because unlike the legislature who can have debates and talk about nuance and give and take, if the voters get a ballot initiative, all they can say is yay or nay. Um, and it's too complicated to try to throw in all this other stuff, which is which is what they're trying to do. And there are five versions of the initiative that will be heard by the SJC next week. And I would just note that there is a point of agreement we have here and that the legislature is the place to deal with nuance, which is why we've been asking the legislature for more than three years to address this issue and bring all parties to the table to find a solution. Just like they did in Washington state when they brought labor and democratic lawmakers and companies and drivers together to find a Washington state specific solution for ride share cut drivers. We think that the legislature is the best place to bring everyone to the table and find a solution that works for Massachusetts. But, but you know what the actual answer is, is that we have laws here in Massachusetts and these companies should just follow the laws. We have good laws that work. The problem is, is that they have not been followed by these companies. We need to get them enforced. Um, I'm very pleased that the attorney general's office has been continuing its fight to ensure that these laws are enforced. We are looking forward to seeing the results of that lawsuit later this year. Um, and hopefully... Um, the law will finally at last be enforced, justice will be served, and these companies will not be allowed to buy themselves out of the law. We have one more question in the um, Q&A. Um, an attendee wants to know, uh, Connor, um, one, whether Uber and Lyft are transportation companies, and two, whether the drivers provide an integral service to Uber and Lyft. I don't work for Uber and Lyft. I work for the coalition. I would say Uber and Lyft are technology platforms. I can't speak to what's integral to their to their business. So Uber and Lyft have been arguing for years in court that the reason that they think that they aren't that the workers aren't their employees under our ABC test is because they claim that they aren't transportation providers. They are technology companies and courts around the country have rejected that argument. It's obvious that they're transportation companies. It's just a play on words to say they're a technology company. Any company uses technology. That doesn't make them a technology company. All right. Catherine. Thank you. I'm sorry. I know we could talk for more hours on this topic. And Connor and Shannon, thank you so much for joining us um, and providing so much necessary information on both sides of this issue. I know I have a lot uh, to think about and research at this point in time, but really appreciate your time today. Katie, uh, thank you for expertly guiding us through this thorny but edifying mm -hmm. conversation. Um, and on behalf of the Rappaport Institute at Harvard, and the Rappaport Center at Boston College School of Law. Thank you all for joining us for this. Um, and please stay engaged with the Greater Boston Debate Series. You can find us very easily at greaterbostondebateseries.com. Um, we are always looking for topic ideas, so please reach out with those as well um, and, and find us online uh, to stay in touch for the next upcoming debate. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening.